The 17 News at Noon podcast is brought to you by Clinica Sierra Vista. Welcome back to 17 News at Noon podcast, where we share your news on your schedule. Good afternoon and thanks for joining us for 17 News at Noon. I'm Nicole Gitsky. We begin this afternoon with a man behind bars after driving under the influence, leading CHP officers on a pursuit, eventually crashing into an apartment complex in southwest Bakersfield. According to CHP, the chase started around 1 a.m. when an officer saw a car blow through a lane closure on Stockdale Highway in McDonald Way. CHP attempted to pull the car over, but the driver, 47-year-old Thomas Lee Fryman Jr. fled. The chase ended when the car crashed into an apartment complex on Bell Terrace near McDonald Way. A woman was inside at the time and suffered minor injuries. CHP says the driver was intoxicated and is being charged with felony DUI, felon in possession of a firearm along with other charges. Now to an update on a 14-year-old boy who was shot Sunday night. Bakersfield police say the teen remains in stable condition after suffering non-life-threatening injuries. The shooting happened in the area of White Lane near South H Street. When officers arrived, they found the 14-year-old with two gunshot wounds. Bakersfield police say an unknown gunman fired several shots at a group of people standing in the parking lot. But the teen wasn't in that crowd, so police say he appears to have been hit unintentionally. The suspect drove away in a dark-colored vehicle. No more suspect information is available at this time. If you know anything about this shooting, you can call the police department at 327-7111. Well, the election to recall Governor Gavin Newsom is officially on. The Secretary of State's office confirming late yesterday afternoon more than 1.6 million signatures on recall petitions are verified. This is the first and now a series of steps that will lead up to a recall election likely later this year. Now, the effort has drawn a range of Republicans vying for the office, including LGBTQ reality star Caitlyn Jenner, former San Diego Mayor Calvin Falconer, and 2018 candidate John Cox. The Secretary of State says counties will have until Thursday to finish verifying signatures. The recall election date could be set sometime between August and December of this year. Some election officials say it could cost up to $400 million. Those who signed the petition have between now and June 8th to remove their signatures, but recall opponents say they think they have too many signatures for any campaign to be effective enough to try to reverse that decision. And Governor Gavin Newsom is speaking out against the recall effort, calling an effort a Republican power grab. The governor tweeted out the following statement. It reads, this Republican recall threatens our values and seeks to undo the important progress we've made from fighting COVID to helping struggling families, protecting our environment and passing gun violence solutions. There is just too much at stake. The statement was sent out alongside a political ad, which claims the recall is tied to QAnon, anti-vaccine extremists and white supremacist groups like Proud Boys. The ad also targets the Republican National Committee for investing $250,000 into that recall effort. While Kern County tends to vote red, the recall effort didn't gain much traction here at home. According to the Secretary of State's office, over 49,000 Kern residents signed the petition. That's just 5.5% of the county's population. The recall was most popular in Sierra County, where more than 13% of the population back the recall. The majority of signatures came from LA and Orange counties, where more than 480,000 people signed on in support of that recall. Now to the latest on the coronavirus pandemic here in Kern County. Our latest numbers are inching toward the yellow tier metrics, indicating the county is doing a good job in the fight. According to Public Health, Kern County could move into the yellow tier as soon as May 12th. Currently, the county already meets two of the three metrics needed to move into the less restrictive tier. Our adjusted case rate is the only thing holding us back. It's 3.4 per 100,000 people, but to meet the yellow tier metrics, it must be two per 100,000. The county must meet yellow tier metrics for two weeks to be able to move into the least restrictive tier. Well, we continue to see no new deaths, indicating the worst of the coronavirus surge may be behind us. Public Health announced 105 new cases today. 1,345 lives have been lost to COVID-19 in Kern County since the beginning of the pandemic. Currently, 31 people are in the hospital, according to state data, and just seven are in the ICU. Those are some of the lowest levels we've seen since the beginning of the pandemic. 
Well, the more than 1,300 lives lost in Kern County isn't just a number. They were friends, neighbors, and family members. We've created a special section on our website called the Those We've Lost Photo Gallery to honor the memories of people who died during the pandemic. You can upload their photos and share their names and your memories of them. Just go to KGET.com. And a local church is inviting the community to a memorial service for everyone who died during the pandemic. Rising Star Baptist Church in Southwest Bakersfield says it's putting on the memorial event because many people didn't get to properly say goodbye to loved ones due to the pandemic restrictions. The Memorial Memories in May event is scheduled May 16th at 3 p.m. at the church's location on Wilson Road, just west of Highway 99. To submit a name to be included in the memorial service, you can call 831-2567 or you can email risingstarbaptistchurch at gmail.com. Well, one of the best ways to protect yourself against COVID-19 is to get vaccinated. More than 40% of eligible residents have received at least one dose of the vaccine. Nearly 191,000 residents are fully protected. Over 85,000 are partially. Now, anyone 16 and older can get the shot in Kern County, but as our eligibility continues to expand, we are seeing a concerning trend. More people are not getting the second dose, indicating residents aren't fully protected to the novel virus. Meantime, the CDC says if you are fully vaccinated and are outside, then you do not need to wear a mask for most activities. The agency says fully vaccinated people can ditch the mask if they are attending a small outdoor gathering with other fully vaccinated and unvaccinated people. They can also remain unmasked if they are dining at an outdoor restaurant with people from multiple households. However, the CDC still recommends for vaccinated people to wear a mask if they are attending a crowded outdoor event, such as a sporting event or concert. Other events where masks are still recommended include attending a full capacity indoor religious service, going to the movies or attending a gathering with a mixture of fully vaccinated and unvaccinated people that is inside. The CDC defines someone as being fully vaccinated if two weeks has passed after their second dose in a two dose vaccine or two weeks after a single dose vaccine. And the mass vaccination site at Cal State University Bakersfield will close next month as operators transition to mobile clinics. Kaiser Permanente, one of the operators of the site, said the new targeted clinics will be up and running throughout Kern County early next month and will take vaccines directly to communities to help remove barriers and hopefully combat vaccine resistance. The site has administered over 35,000 vaccines so far. They will continue to accept first dose appointments through May 14th. Clinica Sierra Vista is now offering rapid COVID-19 testing and COVID-19 vaccinations. Call 833-278-4584 to make your appointment. But don't delay. Clinica Sierra Vista, putting patients first. And taking a look around town, a resolution to rename part of the Westside Parkway in honor of late Bakersfield Mayor Harvey Hall passed unanimously yesterday. Bakersfield Assembly Vince Fong introduced the resolution naming the roadway as Harvey L. Hall Memorial Highway. Hall was the longest serving mayor of Bakersfield and founded Hall Ambulance Service. Renaming the highway coincides with the company's 50th anniversary. Harvey Hall passed away in 2018. The bill will be referred to the Senate's Rules Committee in the coming weeks. For pregnant women, 24 weeks is a monumental milestone. They are entering the second trimester and the countdown is on to meet their baby. But for one local woman, it is a day she'll never forget after nearly losing her life and her child's life. Here's more on this remarkable story. Local photographer Mackenzie Holler and her husband William had struggled in the past to start a family, but they were finally able to conceive a boy last year. They were beaming, excited to have a family of their own. But things took a turn for the worse at 24 weeks along. I woke up one day and I sat up and I felt like I was going to pass out. I laid back down and I felt like I literally couldn't move my body. And I was 24 weeks on the dot. What's so crazy is the day before I made a joke to my parents and I said, Oh my gosh, I'm going to be 24 weeks tomorrow, which means my baby's viable and they'll save his life if anything goes wrong. And little did I know that exactly 24 weeks on the dot, something was going to go wrong. Mackenzie was home alone at the time, so her mother called 911. Emergency personnel say nothing really seemed wrong, but she was taken to the hospital just to be safe. 
But when Mackenzie arrived at the hospital, they flipped her on her back where she was met with immense pain. It became clear she had free flowing liquids in her abdomen and had to be rushed into surgery. And he said, Mackenzie, we're gonna have to go in and open you up. You're, you're bleeding internally, but we don't know where. And so I'm going to try to open you up through your belly button. And if we can't find it, I'm gonna have to open you up more. And if we keep having to open you, we're, we're probably gonna have to deliver your baby at 24 weeks. And I remember thinking like, this, this is it. Like, this is either like, that he's gonna die or I'm gonna die. And I just really hoped it wasn't gonna be both. This was all taking place amid the coronavirus pandemic. William was not allowed to be with his wife during what may be her final moments. I remember I had her phone and I put her phone on her because um, I was like, they're not going to let anybody inside because of COVID, which is terrible. And I'm like, I, I might not see my wife alive again. He sat alone in the parking lot for hours. Then I get a call from her mom and she says, um, so he only got like two phone calls from my mom, who was back there. The first one was, pray, 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 <clears throat> pray, 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 doesn't look good. Mm -hmm. The second one, um, she said, so his name was Halen, right? And I'm like, oh no. And I said, yes. She spelled it. I was like, yes. And she says, well, your son was born today. Halen entered the world weighing just one pound, eight ounces. He was born so early that his lungs weren't fully developed he was extremely fragile and would spend the next four months in the NICU receiving constant treatment. I tried to keep my expectations pretty low. Like even the first day I saw him, my first thought was like, like he's, he's going to die. And then we'll have no ability to have more kids. And that's it. That's because of an extremely rare condition that put Mackenzie and Halen in this spot. Your placenta is supposed to be like this along your uterine wall, and mine went like this. It grew through my uterus, and there's no saving your uterus after that. So um, it, it was gushing blood into my entire abdomen and um, trying to keep him alive. So my brain was still getting oxygen, my uterus was still getting oxygen, keeping him alive, and obviously my heart. But um, everything else was shutting down, and they told me that I lost almost all of my blood supply. A woman Mackenzie's size has roughly six liters of blood. Mackenzie lost five liters and was on the verge of death. But remarkably, Mackenzie and Halen both pulled through. Halen is now seven months old and is getting stronger every day. Considering the things that happened and what could have gone wrong and the situation we could be living with now, um, everything is fine. I never got to have a third trimester and a lot of people would be like, oh, you're so lucky you didn't get to have a third trimester, but I would have given anything to be able to have him be in my stomach still for a third trimester so he could have been healthy. And I think a lot of NICU moms, especially extremely premature babies, have carry a lot of guilt because they're like, my body failed, my body did this, my body caused him to suffer and go through all of this. but like. It was completely out of my control, and I'm just so grateful that he is alive and that he is doing as good as he is, and he really is a, a complete miracle. And um, when we picked his name, we picked his name before he was ever born, and Halen means hall of light, and I feel like he's kind of living up to that. Mackenzie has become an advocate for blood donations. It is something that saved her and Halen's life. And Houchin Community Blood Bank is in dire need of blood donations, especially type O blood. O negative is the universal blood type that is used for babies in the NICU, cancer patients, and those in emergency circumstances. But this type is rare. Based on the population of the United States, not a lot of people have that O negative blood type. We're talking 40% of the population does have O. But then you have to think about the RH factor, the positive and the negative. The positive is the 40%. Out of that 40%, only 7% is O negative blood type. When you donate, you are helping save up to three people's lives. Houchin also needs all other blood types, plus platelets, plasma, and COVID-19 convalescent plasma if you've had the virus and recovered from it. You can schedule an appointment by heading to hcbb.com. The 17 News at Noon podcast is a production of KGET and Nexstar Media Group. For more on all of the headlines in today's show, head to KGET.com.